so this last um, panel is about this important topic of advancing multilateral action on marine plastic pollution. Let me welcome also um, our two panelists, um, Gillian Dempster, who's uh, New Zealand's permanent representative to the United Nations, and also um, chair of the UN ASOC Working Group on Marine Litter, and um, David Azulai, the managing attorney um, for the Center of International Environmental Law. Um, and I think both of you are based in Geneva, um, so thank you for joining from, from Switzerland. So as a brief introduction, I've prepared a few slides um, which might um, be useful to, to set the scene on um, the issue of marine plastic pollution, but also on uh, global environmental governance and multilateral agreements. At Chatham House, at the Energy, Environment and Resource Programme, our acronym that we uh, often use is EER. Um, we also use this um, uh, acronym for, for a different name, Emerging Environmental Risks. This is um, uh, one area that we are particularly interested in. And so the issue of um, marine plastic pollution is one of the big emerging environmental risks um, which uh, deserve a lot more attention. And what I've done, I've, um, I've looked at the scientific publications on this topic. And in this graph I have here, you can see that it has been increasing rapidly over the last 10 years. And um, so the reason the scientific body of knowledge on this topic is, is becoming uh, increasingly uh, is clear. And, and this type of science is essential for the understanding of, of global environmental problems. And it's important to involve the scientific community in the de determination and the scope of uh, policy, policy decisions and actions. So the science policy interaction is crucial for the management of transboundary and global environmental threats. And so I've pulled out some of the recent findings from, from the literature. And what we can see is that marine plastics pollution as stated in these various um, uh, reports, is now is irreversible and, and globally ubiquitous. And that thus meets two of the three proposed essential conditions for the chemical pollution planetary boundary. So the, the third one of these, and um, there the scientific uh, knowledge is still developing, is whether this is going to cause um, disruption to the earth systems processes. But research on this is also becoming, um, um, coming, to, coming together. So we have research that shows that microplastics have already been detected in marine sediments in Antarctica. And, and these levels are often comparable with those found in marine sediments in other places worldwide. We also see marine microplastics are present in all components of marine environments, including marine organisms. So, and uh, plastic marine pollution is an increasing threat also to um, global marine diversity. And there are many more studies which are all pointing into the same direction. So, as we see this problem is of global significance, which requires a global environmental governance approach. And, we know that international environmental agreements, or in short IEAs, and this includes uh, various forms of treaties, protocols, or resolutions, agreements, these are crucial elements of global environmental governments. And um, we know that building successful IEAs is very difficult, but in the past, countries have managed to form these ambitious agreements, and even if the IAAs not necessarily have sanctioning mechanisms, the signatories to these um, often comply. And so treaty design is a key determinant of uh, successful environmental regulatory regimes. Um, there's evidence that well-designed treaties incentivize participation, reward compliance, or deter non-compliance among the parties. And, um, so I've, what I've done also, I've looked at the um, International Environmental Agreements database, and actually there's already 
uh, a large amount of agreements which are um, currently in place. So there are over 1,300 multilateral environmental agreements and over 2,200 bilateral environmental agreements. Um, however, the uh, research has also looked at um, the effectiveness of some of these uh, MEAs. And one of the issues that have been discussed also over the last couple of days is that the circular economy requires uh, policy integration and needs, needs to move, um, cannot be a siloed approach. And one of the issues uh, that has been identified that IEA is not necessarily um, so far have achieved this. Um, so a concerted effort will be required to improve the extent of policy integration by these multilateral environmental agreements. And um, I've also tried to find whether there is currently um, an international environmental agreement on plastics, and so far there is not a specific one. However, plastics would be included in a range of other ones, which include transport, transboundary movements of waste, or um, agreements on limiting land-based inputs into marine environments. And um, this is the last slide, and, and then I'll, I'll finish and hand over um, to the speakers. So we can see that um, there has been a spike in these, um, well, they have been quite popular uh, during the 1990s, for example. Um, there have been many new treaties and protocols but over the last years, um, there haven't been that many new protocols or treaties, however, and a large number of amendments have been made. And in our context, uh, to mention it is uh, an amendment to the, um, to the Basel Convention that we've seen last year that came into place. So some of the interesting questions um, from my side, at least, and I'm sure you, uh, from the audience, you have many more. We can see that current national policies and also current existing agreements have not been able to tackle the problem of plastics leaking into the marine environment. So one of the interesting important questions whether a multilateral environment agreement from the global convention or treaty um, could address this issue. And so now um, um, in this panel, what we will hear is um, what's the current state of the discussions and the negotiations on multilateral multilateral level, and maybe we can also have um, some information and discussion about what are the benefits of a multilateral agreement over existing frameworks such as the Basel Convention or marine-based treaties such as NAPO, or even as we see um, many voluntary industry actions, um, and what are the potential drawbacks, maybe, of, of a legal binding treaty? So these are maybe just some questions to put out there, and I hope we can have a um, stimulating uh, session. I would like uh, to hand over to Gillian. Um, just as an introduction, Gillian was appointed New Zealand Permanent Representative to the United Nations in Geneva in April 2017. And she is an experienced multilateralist, having worked across the spectrum of the United Nations agenda during her career. Gillian has been posted to Geneva previously, as well as to Beijing in China. Um, Gillian was also head of um, Antarctic and Southern Oceans issues, um, leading New Zealand's engagement with the Antarctic treaty system. And she was also a key player in getting an agreement to the world's largest marine protected area in the Ross Sea region of Antarctica in 2016. Julian, thank you for joining um, and over to you now. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so you have a good idea of who I am. Um, I, I normally, although I'm based in Geneva, I'm also a permanent representative for New Zealand to the UN Environment Programme in Nairobi, um, uh, which I, I carry out remotely. Um, some might say that I'm doing all of that work remotely, as uh, many of us at the moment. Um, but I was asked in uh, 2018 whether I would consider being the co-chair at that stage of 
a process that had just been established by the UN Environment Assembly uh, to address the critical issue of um, marine litter and microplastics. Um, this was not a new issue for the UN Environment Assembly. In fact, since its first meeting, uh, it's now had four meetings. Uh, at its first meeting, this was one of the resolutions and it has appeared ever since. However, um, in, in 2017, sorry, 2018, um, at the UN Environment Assembly, they decided for the first time to establish an expert group, uh, which would meet on an ad hoc basis to um, further consider this issue. Uh, as many of you might know, the UN Environment Assembly is, is somewhat of a new beast uh, on the multilateral circuit. Um, it's only had a few meetings. This is the first subsidiary body that it's ever set up. Um, so in that respect, we've had uh, the benefit of being able to be trailblazers in our methods of work, uh, still working within UNEA's rules of procedure, but um, really looking at what was going to be the most effective way to meet the set of challenges that we had been uh, given by UNEA. Um, so just to, to go over the history a little bit, um, we had our first meeting in May 2018. Uh, that was a very well attended meeting held in Nairobi. Um, and uh, it was a short but quite intense discussion and we realized that the mandate that we've been given was enormously broad and that for many of the participants, um, they all were expecting different things to come of, of the discussion. And so actually in our subsequent two meetings, we've spent quite a bit of time trying to refine down into a workable output what it is that, that we might be able to deliver back to the UN Environment Assembly. Uh, we had a second meeting here in Geneva in December 2018, and then uh, a third meeting in November 2019 in Bangkok, and we were supposed to be meeting in Lima, Peru in about four weeks' time uh, for our fourth meeting, and, and then in Kigali, Rwanda in November for our fifth meeting. Unfortunately, um, World Health has intervened. Uh, and so we're now, like, like many in the world, trying to figure out how we can progress our agenda um, from the safety of our own uh, home office setups. Uh, it's not, not ideal, but we are just trying to work through uh, as best we can at the current time. Uh, I think it's important to say at the outset what the group's mandate is and is not. Uh, as the title says, we are an ad hoc expert group um, established by UNEA and, and our purpose is really to present to them some options for consideration about what might happen at the intergovernmental level going forward. We are not a negotiating group. Um, we are not the deciders ourselves. Our job, as I see it, is to interrogate uh, the very broad range of issues and to come up with a, a more manageable uh, set of options that hopefully will then be picked up by, by the UN Environment Assembly to decide what is a suitable pathway forward. Um, we are an expert group, which means that we are a mixture of state representatives, um, civil society, uh, all of the, the Rio framework um, major groups, including industry, um, uh, workers, civil society in its broadest sense. Uh, this is a real strength, I think, of the group because we have a slightly more informal way of doing business. Um, we break out every now and then into, into uh, smaller discussion groups to really dig down into uh, specific issues that we've identified as need to be progressed. Um, so we can have a very free and frank exchange from time to time about what are the actual obstacles to making any progress at the international level. Um, but I think I should, I'd be remiss if I didn't actually tell you what our specific mandate is, because this was very, very difficult to get agreement on at both UNEA 3 and UNEA 4. And it will help you to understand uh, the complexity of the task that, that we're working on. Um, so at UNEA 3, the tasks we were given were, were fivefold. Uh, firstly, to explore all the barriers to combating marine litter and microplastics 
including challenges related to resources in developing countries. Uh, secondly, to identify the range of national, regional and international response options, including actions and innovative approaches and voluntary and legally binding governance strategies and approaches. Thirdly, to identify environmental, social and economic costs and benefits of different response options. Fourthly, to examine the feasibility and effectiveness of different response, response options. And fifthly, to identify potential options for continued work for consideration by the UN Environment Assembly. So we, we did that for two meetings. Um, and, and then we were, uh, it was discussed again in, in great detail and negotiated, I think it was possibly uh, the most difficult um, resolution to get agreement on at UNEA 4. Um, so our mandate was then clarified, uh, continued and clarified, uh, that we needed to also take stock of existing activities and actions by governments, regional and global instruments, international organizations, the private sector, non-governmental organizations, and other relevant contributors to reduce marine plastic litter and microplastics with the aim of long-term elimination discharge into the oceans. Uh, secondly, identify technical and financial resources or mechanisms for supporting countries in addressing marine lit plastic litter and microplastics. Uh, thirdly, to encourage partnerships that undertake activities such as the development of source inventories, the improvement of waste management, uh, awareness raising and the promotion of innovation in relation to the prevention of marine litter, including plastic litter and microplastics. And finally, to analyze the effectiveness of existing and potential response options and activities with regard to marine litter, marine litter and microplastics at all levels to determine the contribution that they make to solving the global problem. So this, these two mandates, which need to be read together, really uh, provide the framework for how we are approaching our discussions. And, um, and actually at the third meeting uh, in Bangkok in November, we really spent a lot of time just deciding how we would move forward at our fourth and fifth meetings, whether we had the information at hand that we needed to answer some of these, these issues, uh, whether we needed to do, uh, to intensify um, the collection of such data, bearing in mind that, as you've already heard, there is a vast range of existing activities and initiatives, including at the intergovernmental level, um, which are designed to reduce uh, marine litter and microplastic, or should have the, the um, ability to reduce marine litter and microplastic. But as a, a 20 years uh, multilateralist, um, I would be the first to tell you that uh, the best legally binding framework in the world is only as good as its implementation and enforcement. Um, and, and that what you want um, in order to achieve your effectiveness goal might look very different depending on political will, depending on the capability of countries to implement, and depending on the level of cooperation between uh, states and private sector and other civil society actors. Um, so my job as the chair is not to direct or promote any one um, uh, option over another, but more to try and synthesize the enormous wealth of experience that, that we collect in our meetings, um, to try and make that into a coherent uh, forwards pathway where we, are, we don't get so overwhelmed by the range of issues um, that we can't provide some kind of coherent advice. Uh, back to you, Naya. It's a huge challenge uh, and, and many different stakeholders want different outcomes. We have one huge advantage, uh, which is that we've already identified that this is an urgent problem and of global concern. Uh, it says it in black and white in the, the resolutions that we've negotiated multiple times at UNEA. Um, so really, we all understand that this is something that we don't want. Uh, the question is how to achieve that goal of, of preventing and addressing it. And that includes a, a very wide spectrum of, of um, potential response options. Um, a lot of people 
I think if you were oversimplifying our work, you might say it's to decide whether or not we need a legally binding international framework to address marine litter and microplastics. That is one thing that we might consider, but there is also, through our discussions, it's been very clearly identified that um, there are already a, a quite a range of existing uh, commitments that, that states have that are not being implemented fully and also a really broad spectrum of uh, regional agreements that could facilitate stronger action to prevent uh, marine litter and microplastics um, from entering the oceans. But um, again, it, it really depends. Every country is different. Every region is different. Every sub-region is different. And so um, finding a one-size-fits-all solution uh, is very challenging. Um, Every time someone says to me, I, I think we need a legally binding agreement, I always say, that's great. Now, what would you like it to do? What will it help you to do? And the answer to that is really different depending on the conversation that you're having. So trying to design a framework that might um, meet the needs of the majority um, is, is a big task uh, that might be ahead of us. And it might include a legally binding instrument. It might include um, a legally binding instrument and some other things, or it might not include a legally binding instrument at all. Um, one of the other big issues that I always highlight, and this is from my 20 years working around the UN and other um, multilateral agreements, is that if you want something to happen fast, sometimes a multilateral discussion uh, might be contradictory to that. So there's no substitute for taking actions that you think might be effective in, in the shorter term without waiting for a silver bullet of uh, an international agreement or framework. Um, so I think uh, that more or less sums up where we are to date. Um, we're looking, as I mentioned, at, at ways that we might be able to um, continue our work without meeting in person, which is always the first best option. Um, it's a challenge. Everyone is sharing this challenge, and I, I have some optimism that, um, that multilateralism can start to work um, in a more flexible and agile way to respond to the current challenges that we have. Um, I'm certainly continuing my discussions with interested stakeholders in the in the interim. Um, I should say also that we we have um, a series of papers that were requested um, for the last meeting that um, that do um, already provide us with a really useful stock take of where things are at at the moment. Uh, these are on a, a number of areas. Um, including on effectiveness. Um, there's been an analysis done of uh, where stakeholders were invited to submit what they've been doing, what they thought was good or bad about it, whether it had actually helped them to resolve it, because that was one of the things that we had identified as a, a knowledge gap that there was a huge amount of activity and it was very hard for individual um, responders to be able to pinpoint what might work best for them. So we thought collating some of that information could be of real benefit and could help us to then analyze whether there might be a global approach to that or whether we might be better with, with regional approaches. Um, so that work has been ongoing. Um, we're also um, continuing work um, around a, a stock take which drew together some of the existing work that had been done through other forums, including Basel, uh, including um, Plastic Waste Partnership, for example, um, and uh, a, a very broad range, uh, OECD, regional seas programs, etc., uh, and invited a very broad range of participants to submit their own um, stock take of, of activities uh, just to provide that as a resource as well. And then we've done some additional work on financial and technical resources and mechanisms, which again is drawing on 
uh, the broad range of activities that are going on at the moment, um, identifying potential funding sources for states and other actors trying to take um, action uh, in their own settings, and just be able to take a step back and analyze whether the funding that was available was known, uh, whether it um, could be channeled in the right directions if it wasn't known uh, and, and whether there were other ways of, of examining that problem such as innovative financing, EPR, etc. Um, and finally, just to mention that we see partnerships as a really crucial issue, but one that is uh, cross-cutting and that includes um, public-private and public civil society partnerships that, um, that are fundamental to um, tackling this problem as we go ahead. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a bit uncertain when or where we will meet again. Um, we know that we are charged with providing a set of recommendations back to UNEA 5, which is supposed to be held in February next year. Um, how we go about doing that, we will have to uh, tackle that as a big and important problem right now because our traditional meeting format is, is not available to us right now. I'll finish there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Gillian, for this overview. It's, um, it's very, very good to hear the current state of the discussions and, and uh, what has happened over the last um, few years. I hand over to David now. So David Azulay um, is the managing director attorney of um, CL's, I'm not sure if this is the right pronunciation, pronunciation for Center of Envi International Environmental Law. Um, at the Geneva office, and you're also the director of the Environmental Health Program. Um, and you're also co-leading the plastic work, examining the environmental health aspects of it and coordinating civil society's engagement in global policies forum, uh, such as the UNEA and the Basel Convention, which were um, already mentioned. David, yeah, the floor, the microphone is yours. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for the floor, and thank you very much, Gillian, for the very good overview of uh, what's been going on so far. Uh, maybe I'll start with a couple of preliminary remark about setting the, the context. First of all, let me check. Can you all hear me well? Yes, okay. So um, a, a quick, uh, a few introductory remarks. One about uh, our work and where we, where I will be speaking from, what position I will be speaking from, basically. Uh, Ciel has been engaged in the global policy plastic related work for about four to five years now. And in the past three years, we've, uh, uh, started coordinating the broader civil society's input into the various processes, whether it is the UNEA process and the expert group that was just described uh, by Jillian, the Basel conventions or other. And by coordination, I mean that not only do we coordinate uh, environment and other public interest NGOs, but we're also uh, working in very close collaboration with a number of other UN major groups which is the women's major group, the workers major group, children's and youth and other. And we're really trying to bring the, the perspective of civil society into those, uh, different, uh, those different processes. In that context, together, all of the major groups have prepared a, um, a position paper for, I think it was for the second uh, expert group meeting that took place in, in Geneva last year. And a number of the, the position that I'm going to be talking about now are also the result of the ongoing discussion, detailed discussion that has been going on in the context of the, uh, of the expert group. The first element, I think, to note is while the framing of the discussion is around uh, marine plastic pollution, uh, I think a lot of the discussions so far have established that the, the issue is actually broader than just the ocean. The ocean uh, uh, issue is of particular relevance, is of particular visibility, but the latest studies since this work has started are uh, consistently showing that the level of plastic pollution in the air or in the soils uh, are at least equivalent to what we find in the ocean. So there is really a need to address this question uh, quite broadly and, uh, and holistically. Uh, 
Another element that is key to understand uh, as we're thinking about designing potential solution to this crisis is the overall context of uh, plastic production and of the petrochemical industry. If you look at curves that uh, show the future production or prediction of production of virgin plastic, what you see is actually an exponential curve. Uh, so uh, there is currently a major build out of facilities to produce even more virgin plastic. And that needs to be considered as we assess and evaluate possible responses option. Because ramping up our um, waste management capacity, for example, uh, is already a major challenge in the face of the amount of plastic that we're producing today. But uh, given the 30% uh, increase that we're looking at within the next five years, it would require such an investment to even slow down the rate of leakage into the environment, ocean and other compartment of the environment, that really this is something that needs to be considered. And this might uh, also relate to one of the uh, questions that you've um, asked uh, before, a general question for session. And that leads me to the next point that is that has came out that has come out very very clearly both from the UNEA discussion resolution as well as from the uh, discussion in the expert group that was actually uh, clearly established in the report from the second expert group is the need for our work to consider the full life cycle of plastic and really looking not just at the waste management option or how do you stop plastic from getting into the ocean but how do you look at the full life cycle and come up with systemic um, responses to the challenges that we are um, uh, that we are facing. So that is really the context in which we're working. A, a lot of the work that has already been done has been presented uh, by Jillian before, but one thing I would like to mention in particular was a very large and extensive report that was prepared uh, by academics. Uh, in preparation of, uni of, th of the UNIA 3 meeting, which looked at what are the existing uh, global instruments that are relevant to address the plastic crisis, what is their efficiency, and trying to assess what are the gaps, the existing gaps in the global legal framework. And what that report concluded was that there was indeed quite a large number of instruments that were very relevant to addressing um, the, the plastic crisis and the plastic in the ocean crisis in particular. Uh, however, there was no coordination mechanism and there was no single instrument or no approach, even combining those different instruments that allowed to address the full life cycle of um, the full life cycle of plastics. And so the report went into possible options of how could you expand the scope of the existing instrument, whether it's the IMO or London Protocol, whether it's the Basel Convention, SICAM Stockholm, or other types of convention, what would happen if you expanded the scope to try to address this particular issue? And the conclusions of the authors were that even if you did expand to the maximum the scope of those various instruments, you would still have some gaps and they would still, the authors still so value in coming up with a um, multi-layered governance approach, uh, they called it, which included increasing the, uh, increasing the engagement of the existing instrument, increasing the coordination of those existing instruments, but also developing a, um, an additional global instrument that would, uh, that would allow to address the question. Why a global instrument? I'm, I know this has been d discussed uh, a little before, but realizing the global nature of the plastic supply chain where the fossil fuel is being extracted and then sometimes in the, some shale basin in the US 
then transported to produce the, the virgin material, either in the US itself or in Europe or in Asia or other. Uh, then these plastic pellets are produced, they're exported to China and other countries where they're turned into actual products. Those products move around the world again. And once those products become waste, they start moving around as well. So because of the global nature of that supply chain and value chain, it is impossible for any country or region to try to address the crisis on their own. And this is why we're having uh, the discussion that we're, um, that we're having now. Uh, two elements um, to build on what was said before and build on the uh, introductory presentation. Yes, treaty design is essential and is key to what we would be trying to address. And indeed, there are quite a number of um, differing views on what such a new instrument uh, could or should um, should achieve. The good news is, uh, there are a number of good news in the middle of this bleak ocean of bad news. Um, the good news are, I should say that, first of all, there is, as was mentioned by Julian before, quite a large uh, almost consensus, so quite a large agreement with just a, a very small number of countries being the outlier who support the development and looking into the development of a particular global instrument. The other good news is um, we have not waited for the negotiation to start in earnest, or for the discussion to start in earnest, to try to assess what could be the different building blocks or constituting element of a global responses. Uh, a number of options have been put forward by countries such as Norway or Sweden. Uh, we at CL, together with some of our partners uh, with, from the Environmental Investigation Agency and the Macy University in New Zealand, have uh, developed a template or model of what the future instrument could look like. Most of the uh, proposed architecture include a number of different pillars, pillars on the coordination of existing instrument, pillars that are the key on plastic pollution reduction, then a pillar on financial support uh, for the implementation, and a pillar for knowledge production and, and sharing. Different, uh, again, different models are being used or are being put forward, but we're, what we're seeing is a, a great work or great attention being put into identifying what would be the different option depending on what we're trying to, to identify. Um, in that context, one thing to note, uh, it was mentioned before that we now have uh, quite a large number of MEA's multilateral environment agreement, and they're only as good as uh, how implement, how well implemented and enforced they are. I must say that throughout the discussions, one particular instrument is, has been used as a potential model or has guided a lot of our discussion. And that model is the Montreal Protocol from the Vienna Convention on uh, to limit the production and release of ozone depleting substance. And one of the many reasons or some of the many reasons why this is being used as a model is first of all, because this was the most successful uh, MEA that we've seen along uh, the past few decades. And the approach could be very similar in that we're trying to limit pollution coming from a particular categories of substance. Of course, the ozone depleting substances were much fewer than plastics. Their use was also much more limited, but it does provide some sort of guidance and some sort of a hopeful thing to look forward because it can work. And when the world gets together, this is something that, uh, that can be done. Um, among the different questions that uh, were asked also, uh, that you asked before was, could a treaty be a driver for circular economy? And in that respect, this is really what we and a number of other countries, uh, government and civil society partners have been looking at because one of the big challenge that we are currently facing with the, in the context of the circular economy for plastic is how diverse um, and how opaque the uh, plastic constituents are. And so we are finding ourselves with a very large number of constituents, many of them being toxics, many of them being unknown, and unknown 
not just to consumers, but in the supply chain. There are a lot of, uh, when you speak with recyclers or waste manager, they will tell you that one of their main issue is that they don't know what is the material they're dealing with. And of course, this is not something that can be regulated at national or even regional level, or in a very, it would be very, very difficult to do so. So one of the things that has come up in some of the discussion uh, when discussing the possible constituting element of such an instrument is how could we use this treaty uh, to ensure that whatever is put on the market is manageable in terms of quantity and in terms of quality. So we believe that such a treaty would actually be a major driver uh, for circular uh, economy. The last uh, point I would try to, I would address, which is also a question that uh, you've asked before, which is how do you uh, articulate existing versus new agreement and voluntary versus legally binding? I've already addressed some of the existing versus new instrument. It, I think it's very important to realize that this is not an either or situation. We will need the use of all the existing instruments so far, and we're seeing this with the Basel Amendment that was adopted last year, but also all the in-depth legal analysis have shown that even if we use those existing instruments at the max, we will need something additional, if only to coordinate uh, the different action across the globe, across the region, and across the, the life cycle. And finally, when it comes to voluntary uh, versus legally binding, uh, we at CL and together with our partners from the, the very broad range of civil society, believe that unfortunately, uh, voluntary measures have failed to address the question, have only served to confound the issue and make it worse. Uh, you've all seen your social media feed or uh, even mainstream media discussion about what the plastic problem is. You've read probably a lot of pledges about companies about what they would be trying to do. The result of the last 10 years has been a massive investment in the orders of hundreds of billions of dollars to build uh, facilities to churn out even more plastic and nothing is going towards the arrangement. And there are some voluntary commitment, but if you look at the outcome and the result of this, what we see is an increased amount of plastic in every single compartment of the environment. And this is why uh, this question needs to be tackled in a probably a more bold and deliberate way. And this is why we believe uh, legally binding provisions would be necessary to fully address the question and avoid that we come back in five or 10 years and, and look at and have the same discussion again, which doesn't mean that voluntary um, measures or instruments are useless. They have a role to play, but we don't believe that they can replace the, the, the impact or, or they can replace what is needed from a legally binding uh, instrument. So I'll leave it there for now, and I very much look forward to continue the discussion with you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David, for your, for your presentation and um, explaining the work and your perspective uh, from, from CL on, on, on this um, issue. And we have, um, we have a range of questions that have come in. So we have uh, some particular questions um, for Gillian. Let's start with, with these. Uh, one of those is, uh, relates to uh, fishing equipment, whether there is a group, a subgroup of the Atok Working Group covering waste fishing gear. Um, and this is in the context as the, the European Commission has developed the extended, extended producer responsibility scheme for fishing gear and started standardization related to circular design of fishing gear. Um, uh, another question to Gillian relating to this is about um, the pace of t technological change and multilateral action. Um, so the question here is, given the pace of change required and the pace of uh, how technology develops, and an example is, uh, for example, um, Boyan Slack's Ocean Cleanup um, program. Um, I think you're familiar with this. And in, the, in addition to this public pressure, the question is, is multilateralism even able to keep up and stay relevant um, to drive policy? Well, thanks very much. Um, on fishing equipment, it's certainly acknowledged as one of the major sources of uh, plastic pollution in the ocean. We don't have a specific subgroup working on it, um, it but it has arisen um, throughout discussions as, as a specific um, 
area of uh, contributing to the problem. Uh, on the pace of technological change, well, I mean, we have many models across multilateralism. Uh, and I'd say probably internet governance is one of the, the, the easiest parallels where, yeah, you have to design a good multilateral process in order for it to keep up. Uh, if you can't future-proof it, it's it's really um, not going to be that enduring. So it, it's certainly acknowledged as an, an issue uh, as we progress through our discussions. Um, really, I mean, the, the question of product design uh, and the evolution not only of um, alternatives to plastic or different design components of plastic or uh, increasing the level of transparency uh, those are all one part of the issue in the, the whole upstream piece but um, also about um, the agility of responses um, and and actually we've had a lot of quite low-tech solutions that have been proposed uh, that might work in some locations but would be ineffective in others so if we are looking at an umbrella, we, we always bear in mind that that umbrella needs to incorporate uh, upstream, downstream um, technological change um, and, and also uh, different solutions which will be effective in different locations. Patrick, if you allow me just to, to add one thing on the... On the first question about the, the fishing gear, I think this is where uh, what we refer to as subsidiarity in the EU plays a major role. This is where we need to understand that this question of fishing gear is already being tackled to a large extent under IMO and there, there are extensive work plans uh, that are being developed there. And so really the idea for our expert group is to identify what needs to be done in the context of, uh, of the UNIA. So it's taking into account these particular issues, but when we identify that they're being addressed and adequately tackled by an existing instrument, the idea is not to replace and duplicate the work. So this is one of the main reasons why we currently don't have a specific fishing gear working group, because it exists in a, in a different space or in a in different uh, yeah, policy space, basically. So I just uh, see that um, one of the participants, um, Tricia, uh, Trisha de Bourgray, you have uh, raised your hand, um, which is great. So we try then to unmute your microphone that you can. Can you um, hear me? Ask you. Yes, Trisha, yeah. please. Okay, Thank you so much, uh, Gillian. I want to ask you. I mean, particularly on a multilateral level, when uh, at that level we know, uh, and I don't want to bang on about gender, but we know that at that level. Uh, when it comes to all sorts of uh, multilateral agreements or, you know, whether it's peacekeeping or global health or IT innovation, women are very severely underrepresented and in a, in a specific area where they really um, are coming from uh, that community level as well, understanding their own communities. They're not there at the table. So this is when you're talking about government and civil society and NGOs and private sectors. We do you, in your experience at these meetings, do you see um, a high representation of women at the table talking about these incredibly important issues, particularly if you're going to start to create some kind of multilateral agreement or body? Yeah, I've, you know, I've never actually done the crunch the numbers uh, in terms of the participation. My impression is always that we have actually in our expert group meetings, we have very good participation and gender balance. Um, and I always make it a point at any meeting that I chair to talk about, you know, uh, the code of conduct for that meeting, uh, including uh, everyone feeling comfortable participating. Um, but um, I have to say that we haven't had uh, much participation specifically from the women major group, um, apart from at the early meetings. But I think that gender as an issue is, is I see it as cross-cutting. Um, but, uh, you know, I have to say, hand on heart, I think it, it, we, don't, we do have excellent participation from women in, in the discussions it's themselves. Uh, Patrick, if you allow me to add one thing. So first of all, on the women's major group, there are... They are actually quite involved in our inner coordination group within civil society, even though they don't always uh, show up as uh, prominently in, in, the, in the various expert group, but they are actually very actively involved in our internal coordination group. And another thing that I would note is that 
we're also seeing the importance and value of considering the specific impacts on women of plastic pollution, as was um, mentioned by Tricia. There are very specific impacts and women often bear the biggest burden of impact. And in particular, when we're looking at plastics, if you look at the amount of endocrine disrupting chemicals that end up in plastic makeup, or the charge of women in a lot of insular communities and their role in, in feeding their family and in, and in, uh, in making the, 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 the household actually function and work, the impact that is bared on women, whether it's changing delivery system for food uh, from shopping, from something that is packed, that is packed single use or uh, and having to move to a more in bulk sort of buying very often the women bear a very large burden of the impact and this is clearly being identified as some as something that needs to be carefully considered when designing responses option thank you david thank you julian um and i see that uh, carolyn dear burbeck um who is one of our associate fellows working closely with the hoffman center here at Chat chatham house You've posted a number of very good comments and questions, and um, we can unmute you. Uh, thank you both for excellent um, presentations. Um, I'm just wondering, as a complement or as part of the UNEA effort, how much attention there is to some of the wider, um, how we could use some wider set of international economic policy instruments to affect change in this sector. There's been a lot of talk over the last few days about the need for integration of environmental and economic policy making, for example, on the circular economy. We also need this at the international level. You know, in trade discussions, there's a lot of talk about a, how do we promote a global circular economy. And at the WTO, there's interest in many member states in what role they can play um, in terms of reducing plastic pollution and promoting this circular plastics economy. Um, and I think here it's really critical to, to, to bear in mind, as um, David has said, that there are environmental challenges across the life cycle of plastics. And there's also international trade across the life cycles of plastics, not just at the waste end, but in terms of inputs, in terms of packaging use in international trade and plastic embedded in any number of goods that are traded internationally. So what developing countries face in terms of the plastic problem is not just the import of plastic waste, but the imports of plastic of products in which there's so much plastic embedded that somehow they have to deal with at the national level. So I guess it's just an appeal to think of ways that we could use trade policy to improve supply chain transparency across the life cycle. Could we use it in ways to promote a more circular plastics economy to reduce the use of plastic packaging in trade? Um, there's work at the WTO that New Zealand is supporting around fossil fuel subsidies. Of course, they're a major force in bringing down the price of virgin plastic. So I think there's just a sense that we need to look at the, for me, the environmental machinery is critical and international environmental agreements, but we, other, we have other levers also at the international level um, that may have some bite and provide an opportunity to help companies interested in promoting change, like in plastic substitutes. There's many developing countries that have lots of products they'd love to export that are substitutes for plastic. Um, so there might be ways we could support these two as part of a broader transformation. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll leap in there. Yes, well, I mean, I think one of the most difficult and challenging things as chair of the UNEP process is just being fully across all of the other discussions that are happening elsewhere. And in fact, that's been identified as one of the biggest um, challenges for a coherent approach at the global level. Um, I'm certainly aware uh, of the discussions that, that China is trying to get off the ground around WTO. Um, I think they've, they've, like many of us, had, had a few unexpected barriers this year. Um, and, and we've been um, keeping an eye on that and talking um, also in the Pacific context with our colleagues, Fiji, who, who have been uh, supporting that China initiative as well. Um, Fossil, I, I should mention fossil fuel subsidy reform and thank you for raising it. I mean, that was something that New Zealand uh, has been really pushing for a long time. Um, the distorting impacts of, of these subsidies uh, really, you know, uh, have been hampering our efforts for a long time. And we, we're currently in an active process of trying to expand that work um, and, and, and integrate it into other processes. I mean, I think, you know, I, I don't personally 
uh, have a, a strong view on on the right, one right best place to pursue effective action across the plethora of, of potential uh, response points. Um, what I do get concerned about, and that's purely on the basis of, of having to sit and listen to the confusion that exists, is, is a diffusion of effort. What we want is um, everyone to understand what, what is in the toolkit uh, to address some of these issues, what is effective for them, um, and what is effective at the global level. Now, um, the more processes we have, the more of a challenge that becomes. So um, on the, the simplest level, I think um, looking at, at having a better understanding of what tools to deploy and when and whether they're going to be effective or not for the problem that you're seeking to solve is, is one of the critical um, issues that we need to get right. Um, but yes, I mean, certainly loud and clear throughout all of our meetings, uh, we've had countries in particular, I, I always... Um, think back to a colleague from the Pacific who said, listen, we need washing powder, but it comes in a plastic bottle and we don't know what's in that bottle. And then we don't have any way of getting rid of it because we, we needed the washing powder, but we can't afford to, to dispose of this bottle now. And we don't know what we're doing to our health through our disposal methods. And it really, when you break it down to that simple level, that there is so much coming across the borders of countries that simply have no idea how to, how to deal with them. Um, you understand why we've ended up in this with this urgent problem that we have now. David, is there anything you would want to add? No, I, I think that that was already a, a very uh, complete uh, response. If only to highlight again what was said by Gillian, that very acute uh, understanding of the many different places is what makes our work in the uh, in the expert group so challenging because we're trying to bring a lot of knowledge and a lot of different pieces together in one place. And none of us can be an expert in everything that exists in there. And this is actually one of the big value of the work that is currently going on and of a possible, uh, the, the multi-layered governance approach that was proposed uh, by, the, by the report is that it would bring everything in one place and would uh, not only bring everything in one place, but allow for much better coordination between the different instruments and the different levers that that we have. So this, but yeah, th apart from that, uh, everything was very clearly uh, laid out to us. Um, I realize we're already at the end of the hour, but there's still, um, there's still a number of questions. Uh, if you have a few more minutes, maybe we can take another few questions um, to keep the discussion uh, going. So there are, couple of questions related to existing activities and data availability. This is by uh, Nina Mitieva. And so the question is, can a report taking stock of the existing activities in the area of marine litter prevention be expected? So um, that's the first one. And the question following this relating to data availability. Another question is that data availability, including data collection, data monitoring, data on leakage points, et cetera, is a huge issue in the field of marine litter. So it is very difficult to define a baseline against which you could assess effectiveness of your action or effectiveness of um, an agreement. So what is done or can be done in order to enhance data collection in marine litter? Yeah, um, I am a huge data fan and I'm a huge fan of um, science-based policy making. Um, and and I, I got a bit spoiled uh, in my previous job where I was uh, New Zealand's commissioner to the Commission on uh, Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resource, which um, I think is one of the best examples of how science must drive policy making and collection of data is a compulsory activity for all um, all participants in that um, in that particular region of the world. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have that luxury elsewhere. And one of the, the, the key challenges around data collection is always um, put to us by multiple participants during any of our expert group meetings is, well, should I be collecting the data or trying to clean it up? Because I, I don't actually have the resource to do both. And, um, and by the way, you know, what is the data that you want me to collect? 
and and where do I where would I send it? So um, it's exactly these sorts of questions that are a part of the great filtering mechanism that that we've been trying to establish. And and I think a lot of the papers that we were going to consider at our next meeting, which I think are available now at our our one stop shop um, portal. Um, do start to answer some of these questions. So I would commend uh, um, participants to looking at the existing work that's been done on some of the stock take activities. Um, the latest attempts that we've had have tried to draw together uh, work that's been done in, in other places as well, including um, quite a comprehensive survey uh, the G20 did last year. I mean, they all have their different focuses. And again, that's, that's one of the challenges is, are we asking the right questions? And then how can we find a simple way of getting you to contribute that data so that we can start to generate some of the answers that we want? So um, yes, it's a key challenge. Um, I'm not sure that we've quite got it right, but it is. these are definitely critical questions that um, we know that there's a lot more to do that, to um, come up with a satisfactory answer. Thanks. And I'd add just a couple of things. So first of all, this is a very interesting set of questions with a lot of things to unpack in there. Uh, I'll make a first uh, caveat remark on the formulating. Uh, the Talking about marine litter uh, makes it look like we're actually littering the ocean. It's not the action of litter that needs to be prevented. It's the leakage, it's the plastic going out in the environment. And most of it doesn't come from litter. It comes from production and just use and our incapacity to actually manage those ways. But that, that's not the exact question that was being asked. Um, on the data and baseline, uh, I think this is absolutely right. And this is why a lot of the discussion that are currently going on about what could a treaty, what could it do and what would it serve, uh, harmonizing the data collection methodology harmonizing the establishment of baseline. And, and harmonizing all this would be, everybody you talk to would tell you that these would be the first pieces of action that need to be put in place. And this is why we're also thinking of a possible stepwise approach, like what was done with the Montreal Protocol against uh, ozone depleting substances. You first establish your baseline and your methodology to know how to develop the answers, and then you know you can adopt several protocols or additional uh, decision based on the data that would have been collected or based on the baseline that have been established in a way that is comparable, because we currently have a lot of data that is not comparable, and this is a big challenge. Now, uh, Julian raised a very important point. A lot of the countries are saying, but should I collect or should I clean? We don't have enough resources. And even when we're talking about establishing a pollution prevention action plan or even just the baseline, the money is missing for that. And this is also why in all of the discussion that exists, there is a recognition that addressing this crisis will require some financial mechanism to help country implement whatever obligations we end up agreeing to. But, and again, the first step, and this we see, is, it's pretty common in many multilateral environment uh, agreement. The first uh, uh, quick response, I would say, uh, financial response to some of the challenges is provide necessary resources to the countries to establish these baselines and to better understand what is the situation, uh, the current situation in their country and what can be done. And, We've done a lot of work with government in different regions of the world, and they have a fairly good sense of what's happening in their own country, but there's so many things happening around their borders in the neighboring countries, or even the trade flows that are still unknown, that they are very much looking for help and support in identifying this baseline and the current situation to be able to develop uh, the most efficient and effective solution. So this really goes back to why a global instrument would actually make a lot of sense. Uh, and of course, the point is taken, it might take a lot of time, and this is why we should think of wise approach and what needs to be done first so we can then develop the rest of the options. But then I'm probably going into too much detail what my thinking of it. I think we have maybe time for one more question, and um, it's it's a question relating to the to the process um, of the of the working group and, and uh, meetings that going forward. So, as uh, the question is, as the next date of the as the date of the next working group meeting has been delayed, 
is it still possible for governments and stakeholders to submit input? And I'd like to add something to this question. Um, how can groups which have so far not been involved in the process uh, can contribute? Um, what, are, what are your asks? Um, uh, how can we, um, in addition to some of the things I mentioned before, how can we participate, join, and um, uh, engage? Yeah, thanks. Well, I mean, we're still discussing it. The the bureau of the of the um, expert group met last week, and we we uh, had an initial run around the ideas for how we might continue to progress our work. Um, I mean, we've, we've tried to keep the process as open as we can. Um, and that means that we have welcomed submissions from all stakeholders consistent with the, the rules of procedure of UNEA, uh, which of course we have to abide by. Um, so um, from my perspective, yes, we are still open to contributions uh, because we are an expert group. We are looking for expert advice and we're bringing expert advice. Um, as we move ahead, um, I've got a couple of ideas uh, about how we might be able to continue our work, but I need to socialize them um, across the regional groups and, and see how they respond. As, as anyone uh, who's attended a multilateral meeting knows, it's really hard to make sure that you've got a participatory process and it's really critical that we, that we have one um, and it's not so easy to do that across time zones and with diff different technological capabilities and capacities. And so uh, it's a challenge. Um, I'm, I'm working with other uh, agencies at the moment to see what's working, what's not working. And I think in a few months time, assuming that we can't get um, back uh, to work as, as we're used to working, uh, we will be starting to innovate. And I, I would like to think that that created um, a continuation of the opportunities for broad participation from uh, all stakeholders. And one thing that I would uh, add to your specific question, Patrick, how can people get involved? Uh, there are different responses depending on where you sit. Uh, and I would say if you are a government, the, your, first, your best thing to do is nominate an expert and Join the, dis join, join the discussion as an expert. You can also do this uh, as any entity, whether you're academia or industry or an organization. But in this particular case, because of the vast amount of work that has already been done, my recommendation would be to connect with the major groups that are most relevant to your particular field. There is a major group for uh, scientists and academia. There is a major group for local authority. There is a major group for uh, industry. There is, so all these major groups exist. And in each of those major groups, you will find people that will have a more detailed understanding of what work has already been done in terms of what the process is, of what the particular group has been doing and what has been the position of this particular group. And so I would argue that this would be the, um, uh, the most efficient way to get involved in this, to get on board that fast moving train, basically, uh, as, as it is moving. Uh, there is also probably the good place to start. There are a number of articles that have been written or even just newsletters that have been published reporting on the different events that have taken place from UNIA 2, 3, the expert group 1, 2, UNIA 4, uh, et cetera, and probably getting acquainted, familiar with this material, but will give you a good indication of what are the questions that are being discussed, where to engage and how, and then connecting with uh, the existing major group, uh, I think would be your, uh, your best chance. I think um, that's, that's a good ending. Um, opportunities for further engagement. Julian, David, thank you again for joining the session and, and um, presenting on this topic.